At Charitable Ingenuity, we have invented a bioelectric fuel cell that powers an LED light. We call it the liquid light because it uses water and microbes to generate power. Now, our new invention is blessing many people with light in rural African villages. In this video, we will share with you how to make your own water-powered liquid light. Hello, my name is Alan Reiser. I am the president and founder of Charitable Ingenuity. I've invented a light we call the liquid light, and I'm going to show you how to make your own liquid light so that you can bless the lives of people around the world that don't have the opportunity to have electricity. So this is the liquid light, and let me explain just a little bit about how the liquid light works before I show you how to make it. The liquid light is a bioelectric fuel cell that runs from microbes, so it makes it a rough microbial fuel cell. It also uses a galvanic or a redox reaction to power the light. So roughly what happens is microbes, which come in dirty water, so you can add dirty water into your liquid light, and the microbes will already be in there. So you've created an environment for microbes to thrive by closing the lid and having dirty water in there, the microbes will th survive. Microbes create oxygen. So as the microbes thrive, they create oxygen, which in turn makes the liquid light work. You can use a plastic bucket or anything. It, do it, it doesn't have to be this exact configuration. Now here, you can see that I have a piece of magnesium, piece of carbon, how I've attached my wires here. Now this is, this is a liquid light that has been running for one year continually off one and a half liters of water. And you can see how this, this has started to build up here. But you can see how the um, magnesium is starting to, to, to rust away a little bit. Um, that's called a sacrificial anode. Here is another configuration. I actually put a, a light switch on the top. And this one is running off of salt water. So salt water acts as an electrolyte, meaning that it will carry the current through the system a lot better, which gives you a little bit more energy. So microbes will also carry an electron for you, but salt acts as a good electrolyte. So if you live next to the ocean or a mineral springs or anything with sulfur or anything like that, you can pour that water in it. That's going to work a lot better for you. Or you can just add some salt. Here's another one of my lights. It's running off swamp water and mud. Now this light actually went dim on me and I went out to the swamp and I got some more water and I put some more dirty water in it, and it works really well. It's not quite as clean as just the liquid light, but this is full of microbes, and it reacts really well, and it works really well. So if you want to go to the river, stream, the swamp, stir up that nasty water and get some of that really dirty water that's full of microbes and use that. So you can just put the dirty swamp water right in there and create an ecosystem with microbes in there and they will create oxygen and away you go. Okay, this is a simple assembly of the liquid light. This is a PVC cap. This is your carbon plate, a spacer, another carbon plate, a spacer. Here you have your PVC nipple. And we have our nylon nut. Again, you can use whatever type of nuts you want. I use nylon because they're a lot better for the water environment. Now the carbon or the graphite, whichever you choose, is the positive. Now remember, LEDs are polarity sensitive, so you have to have the positive and negative correctly. This is the negative. 
the one wire that comes out the top. Now you can see how I've, I've coated this with rubber to preserve it. I've also put some what they call some heat shrink on that and then I've coated all of that with rubber. I also put a crimped on a round connector. But you don't have to do all of that stuff. If you don't have access to all that stuff, you can actually grab a wire, wrap it around there, tighten it down, put your nut on. So you don't have to worry about all that fancy stuff if you don't have it. Now the two carbon plates have to be connected. So this wire goes over here to this carbon plate, then this one will come on here and it will go out to the box. Now the secret, I've done years of experimenting with this, well several years anyway, is one of the keys to making this work, one of the successful things that I have found, that because of the lack of a really good electrolyte in this system, we need the positive and the negative very close to each other because the electrons are escaping. They don't have far to travel, which increases the power. So this spacer, the thinner you can get the spacer, the closer you can get the magnesium to the carbon, the better off you're going to be, the more power you're going to generate. So if you can get that within just a very little distance, you're going to have a lot better success. Another thing that I found there's no replacement for surface area. So you can you can build voltage very simple with all kinds of different uh, systems similar to this, but you can't build amperage. So through my testing and experimenting, I found that surface area makes a huge difference. So you can see the magnesium that I've chosen to use has a lot of surface area. The reason I have two pieces of carbon on here and I've got it on both sides is because of surface area and as the electrons escape from the magnesium they don't have far to travel. Now the carbon is also the most conductive thing that I could find. In fact I'm quite sure that carbon and, and graphite are the most conductive elements that we have. That's why I've used carbon. Now you can use different metals copper, tin, stainless, aluminum, different combinations will work. But there's, it's through all my experimenting, magnesium, and you can get a chart that will tell you how much potential voltage for each element. But magnesium has the highest potential voltage. And carbon is the best conductor, carbon or graphite is the best conductor that we know of. So that's why I chose the elements that I did. But those are the secrets that make this thing work really well. All right, the last key to making the liquid light work is getting the proper LED bulb. LED bulbs are polarity sensitive, so remember positive, negative, has got to be hooked up correctly. Now, the liquid light when it's new can create up to 1.75 volts and will sometimes level off at around 0.8 volts. So that's not enough to run a three volt LED. So what we do is we use a jewel thief or a jewel ringer. It's a very simple electronic circuit. It comes in a lot of the flashlights. You don't have to build your own or you can build your own. It's very simple. You can look them up on the internet how to build one. It consists of a coil a transistor, a resistor, and a couple of capacitors. Now this is a very nice one I built myself. You can get them in flashlights that are relatively cheap and easy. I know it's hard to see these. But it's a little tiny miniature circuit in there. So all we got to do is we got to solder our wires to the positive and negative. And to show you how small these things come in is there's a little tiny micro circuit right in the back of there. So what you do is you look for a flashlight that takes one one and a half volt battery. That will have the circuit already in it. So this light right here is what I've done is I've welded the positive to the center and the negative to the outside. 
I've taken out all the rest of the stuff in there and run the wires through the back to the liquid line. That's it. I hope this helps you understand more about the liquid light. My name is Alan Reiser. I'm the president of Charitable Ingenuity and the inventor of the liquid light. This is the first liquid light that's been running for 14 months straight without stopping, same water, 24 hours a day. I invented this light to bless the lives of people that do not have the opportunities that we we share in this in this country but I, I'm a humanitarian and I would love to help you or your organization to bring light to people in remote areas that do not have light you can contact me you can email me send me uh, give me a call um, Look me up on Facebook, see Charitable Ingenuity on the web. But we would love to help you and your organization to, to bring light to somebody who is not so fortunate to, to have light. Um, we've put these in Zambia, Tanzania, Kenya, and Ethiopia. And we'd, we'd love to help you get some into to your area. Now, we make these one by one. We'd be happy to, to make you some or to, to, to help you make your own. We thank you and uh, God bless you and we hope to be able to continue to put our lights around the world. And with your help, uh, if you would like to donate, if you would like to donate to us, we would, we would love and appreciate your donations to, to help us in, in, in our projects. And we have many different inventions that we, that we do and we would, would love your support. We appreciate you and we thank you for, for all that you've done for Charitable Ingenuity. I'm going to show you how to tell magnesium from aluminum. Here we have aluminum and I'm going to pour some just some regular vinegar, apple cider vinegar on the aluminum and you can see there's no reaction. Now I'm going to add it to the magnesium. Look at the reaction on the magnesium. That's how you can tell the difference between magnesium and aluminum. You see how it bubbles up and, and uh, reacts with the magnesium when you put vinegar on it? So one of the first questions you're probably asking is where do you get the magnesium and why do I use magnesium? Magnesium comes in all shapes and sizes. There are some tubing, pieces of tubings I had here. These are water heater anodes that I've drilled holes in. This is a bigger water heater anode. And also, magnesium comes in Volkswagen engines are made out of magnesium. This is a magnesium float, because magnesium is very light. And you could also use this type of magnesium for, for your anode. Now here is two magnesium wheels. Now you might say, well, how do I know they're magnesium? I scraped them down to the shiny part and poured vinegar on them and they reacted. So I know that they're magnesium. This is the source that I use are magnesium billets. And you can get this at any anode systems place. Cathodic protection is there for used for protecting pipelines. And then you can just uh, cut off the end of the billets and slice them. Or if you want to make a great big one, you can use the entire billet there. Here's one of the billets that I've just got through sawing. I saw them into about half inch pieces. And this one's almost gone. Some magnesium billets do have metal rods going through the center of them. Here's a magnesium billet with the rod going through the center and that's where they're normally in the cathodic protection where they hook their wire is to the metal rod. Here's a zinc anode that I got off the internet. It's for galvanic protection and it works almost as well as magnesium. 
Here are the carbon plates that I use. You can see how I've sawed this one in half and drilled it. It's a little tricky drilling. Um, I have to come, come from both sides so it doesn't crack out. Here's, here's what the plate started out as. Now, now this, this carbon um, or graphite, you can use either. Sometimes you can find them in a combination, carbon graphite. You can order it off the internet. You can find it in different places. Here's a good source of carbon right here on extremely large truck brakes are actually have a high content of carbon in them. And I have used those on occasion to get that carbon out of the uh, brake shoes. You can put your meter on it and if you get continuity through it, that means they've got carbon. The smaller brake pads that I've found usually don't have a high carbon content. Here's some more carbon. This actually, this bottom one is pure graphite, which works just as well as carbon, if not better. And you can see the different sizes. Now these small ones I got off the internet and some of them are graphite and some of them are carbon. And you can see some of the configurations I've, I've played with here. Here's the plastic pipe. This is a piece that I just bought. It's actually designed for sprinklers. Makes it nice because it's threaded. You can make your own length. There's a thread on PVC cap. It's all plastic. And you can see how that fits, how it fits in there nicely so that I can just cut that into, into little spacers. Here's some plastic bolts and uh, I've got, also got nuts and stuff. You don't have to use plastic or, or nylon particularly is what these are is nylon. It's really similar to plastic. But I, that's what I use because they don't corrode um, like, the, like the brass or zinc or, or metal do. But uh, if you can't find those, you can use any bolt. will work. These just work a little better. They hold up a little longer. Here is the plastic or the liquid rubber that I use um, to put over my connections. Again, it's not necessary to use rubber. I just use it to preserve the connections. Can you hear the prayer of the children? Again, thank you, thank you so much for watching the video, and we look forward to hearing from you, and we look forward to hearing your stories about the liquid light, and we hope that we can help you to help those people who 